Can you please state your name, occupation, or affiliation, where you're from, and the year you were president? Uh, my name is Mary Clay, and I'm Professor Emeritus at the University of Auckland. I retired in 1991, and then in 1992 to 3, I was president of the International Reading Association. Could you please describe your work as a clinical psychologist and how it intersects with the field of reading? Well, my, I was told during my training that a developmental psychologist must understand normal children's progress. So uh, that was the, the basis of, of what we learned. Knowing about normal progress, then when you came to deal with children who had some kind of problem, the goal was always in treatment to bring the, ch the child with the problem back onto a normal trajectory of progress. So um, that fitted in with any area of, of children's problems that, that uh, I had to deal with or train people to deal with. So how did reading become part of your work? Uh, well, I was trained as a classroom teacher and uh, then very quickly I moved to work in special classes with children who had low intelligence and I did a master's thesis on those children learning to read. That was many, many decades ago. Uh, and then, as a result of that, I got a Fulbright scholarship to the University of Minnesota, where I took developmental psychology, but as a minor, I studied in the College of Education, and I was taught by Professor Guy Bond, who's one of the um, historic figures in the reading field, and he had studied with Arthur Gates, so I feel my my uh, sort of history goes back into the 1930s, which oh. is a long, long time ago. Um, the, in, in my class at that time, uh, there was an important person. He was a classmate. He was an assistant to Dr. Guy Bond, but he became one of the youngest presidents of IRA, and that was Ted Clymer. And we were studying research back there. <laughs> 1950 <laughs> together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but after that, I returned home and uh, I was married and had two children and did things like teaching remedial reading at the kitchen table mm -hmm. uh, with children in the local district for a period. Could you tell us a little bit about the development of the reading recovery program? It was in 1976 quite late in my career and after I'd become head of department uh, in, the, in the university, head of education, uh, that I felt free to, um, to go back to the study of prevention that I really had thought about in the first place. Uh -huh. What's normal development, what's problem development, and how do you bring the ones with problems back to a normal track. Um, I started that in 1976, and really, Reading Recovery has been the realization of that sort of particular theory about preventive work having a developmental base. And it also involves one-on-one -on -one teaching. Well, yes, because what we're doing, uh, really, um, looking at the diversity of individuals and how very different the causes of the problems of the children are, it's necessary to find, clinically, it's necessary to find an individual treatment program. And uh, what the individual teaching allows is that we can start where the child is, not at any point that somebody else has decreed the starting point is. And we can take the children as fast as they can go, however fast they can move, making leaps and jumps if necessary. So we can get accelerated progress and get them back into the average group of their class quite quickly. So while it's individual, mm -hmm. it's a very short, it's the shortest treatment that we can possibly do. And it's work, we work on the theory that you can take different, uh, children can take different paths to the same outcome. Mm -hmm. So we have to design individual programs for them. The Reading Recovery Program has a strong professional development component. What do you think about the current worldwide push for professional development? Well, I'm glad to see it occurring because um, 
we felt it was necessary. We were going to do a lot of things that were not usually done in schools, so we had to have the teachers well trained to implement both the theory of what we were doing and the practice. So we trained teachers and we trained teacher leaders who trained teachers in different, in different parts of the education system and then we had to have trainers who would train the teacher leaders. So it was a hierarchy of professional development and that has gone across the world to each of the countries we're now working in and is the strength of the whole program. It also allows the program to change. So when we get new in input, new information, new research, we can pass it down from the trainers to the teacher leaders to the teachers and get them to change practice on the ground quite well. So how do you feel about um, the fact that reading recovery is being used throughout the world? Well, I tell the reading recovery people, people to be a bit cautious about that. It's being, it's being used throughout the English-speaking world. That yes. is far from being the world. Yes. And we are working in Spanish, and we have developed the program for French in Canada. Mm -hmm. But it takes about five years to develop the program for another language, mm -hmm. because you're teaching the other language. So it has to be adjusted for the characteristics of the language. It takes a lot of time. And uh, I don't know how much further we can go, but we can certainly serve English-speaking children anywhere. Well, as a developmental clinical psychologist, how does it make you feel to have such a great impact on reading, especially with the reading recovery program? Uh, reserved feelings about that. Uh, knowing how to, um, how to get this progress induces an obligation. Mm -hmm. So if we wanted to spend the money, we could tell you how many children we were teaching at the moment or how many children we taught around the world, and we don't do that because that would take money we want to use for other things. But um, the obligation uh, is there. If you've served a million children, it sounds wonderful, but then there are more, several millions more who needed the program and didn't get it. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain sadness attached mm -hmm. to being able to do what we can do. Mm -hmm. How did you become involved with the International Reading Association? Ah, well, this is a story I like. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, left the University of Minnesota and I didn't pick up on the fact that there might be an association forming, but it was around about the time when the association was getting underway. Came back to New Zealand and did my PhD there. And uh, two New Zealanders, a lady called Ruth Trevor and another one, Yvonne Chapman Taylor, uh, had been to USA, had discovered uh, some aspect of the early development of the International Reading Association and decided we should have one in Auckland. So around about the time I was finishing off my PhD there, um, a late, uh, a late uh, student <laughs> for that, um, they were forming the association. Well, then uh, it just happened that Helen Robinson, whose name is so well known in the International Reading Association, she was at the University of Chicago and she was asked to be the external examiner of my PhD. She put it in the William S. Gray Library where other people saw it. And then she put forward my name to uh, go to the Second World Congress. I missed the First World Congress, but I got to the Second World Congress in 1968. And I had the honor of going to lunch with Albert J. Harris, um, with Connie McCullough, mm -hmm. uh, with Helen Robinson, and a, a famous uh, British uh, person. Magdalene Vernon, who wrote a lot on visual perception and reading. So it really was a fantastic conference for me, a brand new mm -hmm. graduate at the beginning of my research. And then when we went back home, uh, I was president at the time we held our first New Zealand reading conference. And with a colleague, uh, we determined to, to bring as many people as we could across the Tasman from Sydney where the Third World Congress was then underway in 1970, and we got a lot of important people 
including Ted Harris, back in New Zealand talking to us uh, at our conference, which really kicked off the association in New Zealand very well. And then out of that, uh, I had a lot to do with the, for the next few years with the formation of the Australian Reading Association. Mm -hmm. And I also had an invitation to Harvard when they uh, launched their first international study of reading, in which reading uh, New Zealand had done very well. I do have an incident I'd like to tell you oh, sure. about that. Um, I was having uh, drinks before dinner with two so, so important people. One was Professor Benjamin Bloom, and the other was Jim Squires, who is still editing books for uh, in the reading field in, in USA. And Jim, uh, Benjamin Bloom's about my height, which is short. And Jim Squires was up here somewhere, and he looked at me and said, how come a little country like yours could do so well in the IEA studies? And before I could even get my answer out, Ben Bloom said, small scale, just small scale. <laughs> and I, I have often quoted that, and, and when I told him many years later that that's what he said, he said, well, that was a bit impertinent, wasn't it? <laughs> but um, he, in fact, uh, said something pretty fundamental, because since I've been working with reading recovery around the world, if you want to show optimum performance, you do it in a small scale country. And when you get in a large, when you have to upscale to a big country mm -hmm. like USA, mm -hmm. it's much harder to show how well it works. Mm -hmm. So that was very important to me. Mm -hmm. But then out of all those associations, in 1974 and 1975, I was invited to be the international representative on the board, not elected, appointed by the board so there would be an international voice. Now, I wasn't the first. Mm -hmm. Eva Malmkos from Sweden was the first, mm -hmm. but I was the second one. Mm -hmm. That gives me the unusual status of having served three times on the board, oh. which is not allowed in the regulations. <laughs> oh. Okay, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's how I came to be associated with the Reading Association. <laughs> Um, please describe some of your major accomplishments during your year as president of IRA from 1992 to 1993, and what are some of the projects or activities that stand out in your memory and which you're particularly proud? Well, we, we were, it was interesting to me, we were due to have uh, immediately I took office almost, uh, we were due to have the World Congress in Thailand. And I went there on visits and uh, made some terrific friends there in Thailand. And um, then, believe it or not, 1991, terrorist, I think it was, terrorist activities and so forth and so on. No, it must, so it must have been 92. But um, we had to cancel the conference in Thailand and we went to Hawaii and we had a marvelous conference in Hawaii but mm -hmm. uh, it was sad that we couldn't couldn't have the conference at that time in Asia. Um, I did a lot of work I think fortunately on the board at the time we had two international reps because I came from New Zealand and Per Olaf came from from uh, Sweden mm -hmm. so that probably accounts for why we got a few international motions passed yes. and a few changes. Sure. Um, but we tried to strengthen the international committees. We had the world divided up into areas, so there were committees in each of those areas. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that happened was we actually got some financial support from the board going regularly to those committees each year, which made them able to produce buy journals, produce publications, and generally uh, do things they hadn't been able to do before because of lack of funds. Um, another thing I was very pleased to be involved with was the Connie McCullough Awards because some money from her estate had, been, had come to IRA to set up something. Mm -hmm. And in the early days, uh, with the Copenhagen Conference, for example, um, 
she had students there who came from other countries who'd done PhDs with her, uh, one from India and one from Thailand. And I felt that um, it would be great to use the money that she had donated to IRA to, to foster international things. So we began the development of those in my term, but mm -hmm. I, think, I think some loose ends had to be tied up in the subsequent years. She, would be, she did wonderful work in India on mm -hmm. beginning reading and books for children. And uh, it's nice to see her name on those awards now. And then I had the San Antonio Conference, which was a convention which was uh, most exciting. Mm -hmm. And generally, um, I suppose, my interests were in every case to increase the access of children to good teaching, to um, I have strong belief in teachers, uh, given the professional development, can really carry uh, can really involve themselves in theoretical thinking. The only problem is that you have to write for the teachers, not just think of things being watered down for the teachers. So I'm interested, I was interested in publications that would empower teachers to do a better job. And weren't you also the first international president in North America? Now the first, uh, first international, the first really international president came from Canada, okay. but because he was a North American, sometimes I'm called the first international president. Okay. I like to say I think I was the second international okay. president. <laughs> Didn't you work with um, book development and with councils linking to other countries? Yes. Well, um, I think we. Um, there was plenty of joint action. There was a lot of support from the from the board and individual board members. And uh, yes, we got um, uh, uh, we we got stronger councils in different places. I think of Europe as being one of the places mm -hmm. where, which was really going ahead at that time. And of course, it was Pierre Ola from from. Um, Sweet of Finland, uh, we had our contact over there, mm -hmm. and that could be stronger. Also, the Oceania conference, uh, area became stronger because Australia had a big uh, reading association, so had New Zealand, but we had a good reading person in Fiji, Warwick Alley, who got them going too, so we had quite a lot of you know, things going on in that particular area. And also, didn't you work with literacy issues for access to education in different countries? Well, I think those came up always, and my concern has always been with the youngest children. Uh, not because developmental psychologists like to deal with young children, mm -hmm. but because the foundational learning in uh, literacy it can have such an impact on subsequent progress. You know, what you learn in those first two years is so important. Mm -hmm. So I took a particular interest in early uh, literacy education mm -hmm. in each country, yeah. Well, what were some of the major issues that arose while you were president? Well, one issue was the board had moved to encouraging the international countries to become affiliates. This was a new piece in the structure of the association. And uh, New Zealand became an affiliate at that time. And then uh, there was a lot of discussion about Canada. Would Canada become an affiliate? Would they not? They couldn't quite make up their mind what they would be. So I said to the board, well, I'm a Commonwealth person. Maybe if I go to Canada and talk to the Canadians, we can get a little progress on this. So round about, I think it was round about Easter, um, the, the, it, came, it, it became my charge to do what we jokingly call my transit of Canada. So I, did, I started in the western province of British Columbia, and uh, day by day I went through each of the provinces. I went to Alberta and, and then to Ontario and then to the Maritimes, and I went even into Quebec to the English Reading Council that was formed in Quebec. Uh, and we had meetings so that they had a chance to talk through what they would do. And 
Yes, they were still about 50% to be an affiliate and 50% not. But last year, I had to report, I was able to attend 10 years on uh, a meeting of the Canadian Wide Council mm -hmm. for Reading Recovery. So it paid off. We mm -hmm. got some unity in Canada through that particular transit that I did. Mm -hmm. And it was very enjoyable to, to um, be able to work with the Canadians in each of their provinces. So what role did the IRA play in these issues, and perhaps what way should it have played a role? Well, in that particular issue, the, the, the delicate politics of it was that IRA didn't want to, to impose itself on Canada. It, it wanted Canada to make up its own mind. So by getting a, just a single person on the board to go and do the inquiry and, mm -hmm. and do it not as I bring you good news, mm -hmm. but uh, how are you going to solve this problem? Mm -hmm. um, that, that was, uh, I think we made progress then. The other thing um, that I think the board contributed to, to pro, that, that we didn't get contributed to, but we didn't get the um, resolution of it until after my term of office. Mm -hmm. You start things and sometimes they come to fruition afterwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We got very close and that was to have in the USA, leadership workshops were flourishing so that every so often, and I think it was every two years, yes. there mm -hmm. would be a chance for people to, to come together and learn about leadership. But it didn't, it, it didn't apply mm -hmm. to the overseas people. Mm -hmm. So during my presidency, we managed to get through the, the, the motions that led to uh, our New Zealand rep for example, being able to come to leadership conferences in USA mm -hmm. and uh, for that to be funded. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not always easy to find mm -hmm. a large amount of money like that to bring in the international group, mm -hmm. but that was very good progress. Mm -hmm. In what ways have you seen the association grow and change since you first became a member, nationally, internationally? Well, it was really quite small in, in 1968. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the numbers at the World Congress, but the first one was in Paris, the second mm -hmm. one was in Copenhagen. It was exciting, but nothing like the size it is now. <laughs> so we, we, it's now in far more countries. Mm -hmm. There were many blanks in the map that we weren't reaching. and. Um, there are, there's more accessibility to the international, for the international people to compete for research awards and uh, to be recognized by other awards and so on. Um, there's far more members, there's far more publications, and the publications are up to date with the technology yes. and the internet and so on. Yes. Back in New Zealand now I can read the um, Reading Research Quarterly since I paid my sub <laughs> uh, on the internet. And um, I really think there's more responsiveness on the part of the majority of members are, will inevitably, the majority of elected members to the board will always be uh, North Americans mm -hmm. because that's where the voting power is and mm -hmm. so on. But um, there's, there is more responsiveness responsiveness to things uh, out there in other countries. Um, some of the projects that we've been working on for professional development is the Reading Writing for Critical Thinking project. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also doing some projects in Pakistan. So these are just some of the, the international projects that are, mm -hmm. are current. Mm -hmm. um, are there any projects that you have worked with well, um, you just take one step back between uh, before those two, mm -hmm. which I'm not thoroughly up to date with, sure. but, but uh, it was exciting because we began contacts with Russian reading groups before uh, I left the board. Mm -hmm. So it's great to see that. Now, the one I found particularly exciting was the All Africa Conference. Mm -hmm. Um, we, I had tried through, again, Commonwealth links in, with South Africa, I tried to make some, uh, raise some questions as to why we didn't have councils there and mm -hmm. so on. 
And at that time, it had something to do with apartheid. And we were not going to go in there until everybody had equal opportunity to, to join up. And then, perhaps two, three years ago, um, the in IRA joined with, I think it was UNESCO and uh, Reed, uh, which is a group in uh, a book group mm -hmm. in uh, Africa, and some other group, and and mounted an all Africa conference, and that was absolutely magnificent because we seemed to have people from practically every country. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went there and remember that the most exciting performance, the most exciting presentation that we had there came from an Australian, an Australian writer, Mem Fox, who was actually born there of missionary parents. And so conducted a, a little uh, participation act during her session there uh, in in a local language, and the local people all joined in. It was a wow. it was a great conference, and I believe have they had a follow up? They they were go organising a follow up conference there. So Africa is a continent yes. where we've got a lot of lot more work to do. Are there any anecdotes, stories, or remembrances that illustrate what the International Reading Association has meant to you, both professionally and personally? Well, it's just, uh, this is not an anecdote, but I think it's, it's sort of curious that a long way back in time when I was beginning my university work, um, Helen Robinson uh, <coughs> published a book called Multiple, Con Multiple Causation of Reading Difficulties. And I read that in Auckland as a student. I didn't know anything about, well, she hadn't formed them. They had, she hadn't been part of the forming of the Reading Association at that time. Uh, and then she and Albert Harris did work on bringing people together for the association in the 50s. And lo and behold, when my thesis was ready in 1966, she happened to, um, to assess it as the external examiner. And um, I then got to Copenhagen, and my contact with IRA sort of followed from there. Mm -hmm. So I think my association with her and her writing way back in her mm -hmm. earliest days, and mm -hmm. the fact that the theory I work with now is something that she put her finger on way back there in the 1940s is very interesting to me. And there are any other people or places that you went that you would like to uh, talk about? Oh, I got to visit so many interesting people in different places. I mean, uh, Thailand, Sweden, I've talked about Africa, uh -huh. uh, Singapore, we had a fantastic conference there, met, met, uh, and I got back to Singapore several times to do presentations and so on. Usually, if you get there with the International Reading Association, then you get some other contacts and you can go back into those countries. And all that interchange is very important, I think. Is there anything else that you would like to say? Well, um, I just like to reiterate that um, I've tried very hard to write uh, to, uh, the work that I do is not just practical work. The work mm -hmm. that I do is founded on pretty strong theory. Mm -hmm. But uh, the challenge for me is to write those theoretical ideas for the academics and the researchers, mm -hmm. but also for the teachers. I think they have a right to, to be able to read those in terms that they understand. Mm -hmm. So this has been one of my particular challenges, mm -hmm. and I've still got a bit of writing of that kind to do. Are you working on that project right now? Well, no, I, but I have several books that mm -hmm. underpin the Reading Recovery Program. Mm -hmm. They all have to be revised before I'm allowed to completely retire. I see. Okay. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you.